Hi, this is Kendra from Pencil and Pigment, and today we're going to be talking about reds in history. Um, they're not super controversial, but they are incredibly fascinating. Um, the first one I wanted to talk about is vermilion. Now, vermilion originated in China and it was used for about 2,500 years. And it actually ranges in color from orange to purple based on particle size. So the larger the particle size, the more dull and kind of dark orange it becomes. Now, vermilion is made from a powdered mineral called cinnabar. And cinnabar is sort of a byproduct of mercury mining, so it is extremely toxic. Now, mining for cinnabar is difficult and expensive, and it's super dangerous. So that's kind of a trifecta of this isn't going to work well. And in the 4th century BC, they kind of came up with their own synthetic version where they would take it and they would um, mix it with sulfur and heat it. And this worked really well till about the 17th century when they realized that if you put that heated mixture with an alkali and a wash, that it became even more effective. And that's the mixture that's still used today the only problem with vermilion is that when you expose it to light, it darkens. So UV light really darkens this pigment up and that can be a problem for many artists. And typically when cadmium red came along, it replaced vermilion because of this reason. The next pigment I want to talk about <laughs> has the best mythology around it ever that I have ever read or heard. And that is the red pigment called Dragon's Blood Red. Now, this pigment was used for art, but it was also used for medicine. And according to the ancient Romans, they confused Dragon's Blood Red with cinnabar many, many times. They could not figure out which is which. And when they con consulted sort of these medieval encyclopedias, they found this mythological story of dragons and elephants fighting each other in combat to the death. And then the blood was collected and this became known as dragon's blood. Now, we... <laughs> We know that's not a thing, <laughs> despite what people say. But for many years, they could not figure out what it was. And this pigment made its way across Europe via the incense road. So not the trade route that was the Silk Road, but the incense one. And it was used by Italian violin makers as a varnish in the uh, 18th century. It was used as a toothpaste. It was used in India for ceremonies. It was used in American hoodoo, neo-pagan witchcraft. This stuff really, really got around. So what exactly is dragon's blood? Dragon's blood is a resin. It is a resin from tree bark, from rattan palms, and a Draciana species and they used it for dye and medicine. And you kind of wound the tree a little bit. You wound the bark and the trunk. And then from there, you can collect the resin. And that's what made dragon's blood. <clears throat> Which, how wild is that? The only problem with this pigment is that it fades really, really quickly to a dusty red. So many artists were warned off of using dragon's blood because of that reason. The next one I want to talk about is Kermes Lice. 
And yep, that is what it sounds like. So in the Mediterranean, there are these oak trees called Kermes Oak, and they are filled with an insect, a lice insect, that if you squish them, they are filled, it's a red carminic acid. <clears throat> and this was actually used in the Neolithic period up until the 16th century, <clears throat> excuse me, until it was replaced by cochineal, the cochineal um, pigment. Now that pigment, also made from teeny tiny bugs, was used by the Mayans and the Aztecs in the second century BC. And when the uh, Spanish conquistadors came over to South America, it exploded. It became the second most um, sort of exported thing of high value right under silver. So it was worth a lot to South America, to that country for exportation. And it was solely made in Oaxaca by the indigenous peoples there. So it was something that the locals made and sold, which is absolutely awesome. Now, this also made its way across to Europe and it is the color that was used for Britain's army for their uniforms. And it was used by El Greco and Rembrandt. So both were a big fan of the insect pigment, which leads us to talking about cadmium red. You can't go through and not talk about this one just a little bit. So cadmium red, was discovered by a German chemist and he just discovered the element cadmium and it wasn't until the 1910 that it became available as a commercial product so that one kind of sat there for a while till folks could figure out what to do because the element was really really hard to source and it was expensive, so folks had to use it very sparingly. It just wasn't, it wasn't easy to get. So cadmium red really didn't take off like some of the others did till way later. Which brings me to <laughs> scientists doing fun things and creating happy accidents. We have to talk about PR254. So PR254 is called many things. Um, pyro red is what your tubes will say, your tubes of paint. But it is also known as Ferrari red. Now, PR254 was discovered on accident <laughs> by a, a scientist and chemistry professor in 1974 who was trying to make a new chemical, failed, and the leftover residue on his flask was this pigment. Now, fast forward, this was in the University of Michigan, and his name was Donald Ferrum. So, fast forward to 1983, and Chiba Specialty Chemicals, which is a company in Switzerland, patents PR254, and makes it available for the automotive market. Now, previously to this color red, other reds for automotives were very chalky and they would peel and ship. There wasn't a really good automotive red. So when this came along, it was light fast, it was stable, you could heat it. You could do weird things to it chemically and it still held on. This became the perfect, perfect red and was used for Ferraris, BMWs, Corvettes, and it was a great alternative to cadmium red if you could afford to buy it. Basically, folks had to wait the 30 years for the patent to expire so they could afford to use it because Chiba ch charged, they charged a lot for it. Now, they think 
that even though it was a high price, Jackson Pollock in 1956, three decades before it became available, used this paint in his paintings. So those are some of the amazing reds in history. I hope you found this as incredibly fascinating as I did. And I hope you have a wonderful day and I will talk to you tomorrow. Bye.